very warm welcome to this EPC online policy briefing on the Green Deal, the basis for a green recovery. I'm Annika Hedberg, Head of Sustainable Prosperity for Europe program at the EPC, and we're absolutely honoured to have Franz Timmermans, Executive Vice President from the European Commission, to speak about the role of the European Green Deal in guiding the EU's response to COVID-19 crisis. We are expecting around 300 participants, and we very much look forward to today's discussion with you. Just a few words on practicalities. If you are interested to ask a question, there are two ways for you to do that. I'll give you opportunities to speak out. But uh, for this, click on the hand icon next to your name if you have a question or a short comment. Or you can also ask written questions in the space provided. But just please uh, do keep your questions short. Providing a bit of content for today, we are living extremely worrying times. But it is also exciting times if you see this crisis as an opportunity. In many ways, we are at crossroads. The corona crisis and its economic repercussions provide an unprecedented occasion to reflect on the direction where we want our economy and societies to go and where we need to go. The choices, the decisions we'll make today will have implications and not just for the short term but also for the long term. They will determine how fast we'll recover and whether as a result we'll emerge out stronger with the needed skills and solutions to face the next crisis. The discussion that we're having today is extremely timely, not least as the EU leaders will be debating the EU's next long-term budget end of this week. A lot of references are being made to the European Green Deal guiding the EU's response to COVID-19 crisis. This is also reflected in the Commission's recovery plan. But we know this won't be smooth sailing. The political, the economic, the social pressures are enormous. And despite the talk, actually delivering on the green transition, the digital transformation and getting us on a track to achieve a competitive and sustainable climate neutral economy will not be easy. With these words, Executive Vice President, Mr. Tim Emmons, how can we ensure that the Green Deal really becomes the compass for action and our recovery efforts lead to sustainable competitiveness and prosperity? Thank you very much. The floor is yours. Thank you very much, Annika, and I'm really excited to be here with you today to exchange views and to hopefully uh, answer your questions. Um, you know, uh, we've seen over the last couple of years an increasing sense of urgency broadly in the population in Europe uh, about the climate crisis. Um, this, this incredibly powerful and inspiring movement of Fridays for Future of young people at very young age going to the streets demanding us to do something about what they see as an existential threat uh, to their future, and they rightly see it as an existential threat to their future, has also led to a broader public awareness. And I, I was really made aware of that during the electoral campaign for the European Parliament elections uh, last year, when we campaigned on a platform uh, linked to, to what is now called the Green Deal, and there was a really huge positive response to that. So that's where um, we thought we had to do something uh, in, in combining a number of things. First of all, there's a climate crisis. There is also a biodiversity crisis. Uh, as you know, you know we, 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 we might lose one million species, and this has a direct effect on the health of the planet, but also on the health of humanity. Uh, and I think the COVID crisis has driven this point home. There is something wrong in our relationship with our natural environment, and we need to fix that. Um, but we're also in the middle of an industrial revolution. Uh, all the old uh, um, uh, assurances of the old economy are being at least uh, recalibrated um, but very often restructured fundamentally restructured things will disappear new things will appear um, and all of this in the context of quickly changing uh, geopolitical relationships across the world um, you know we europeans who thought we were the masters of the world uh, only uh, less than 100 years ago we are quickly becoming only 4% of the world's population. Um, and um, uh, also our percentage uh, uh, in the world economy is shrinking. 
not because we're doing so badly, but because others are fortunately doing a lot better and coming up, which is a good development. But it means recalibrating also international relations. All of this combined led us to the conclusion that we will need a new strategy uh, to create sustainable growth in Europe, uh, to rebalance our relationship with our natural environment, to make sure that Mother Earth is going to be able to feed 10 billion people in the future, to make sure uh, we uh, comply with what we agreed in the Paris Agreement, which is to uh, limit the rise of the temperature to maximum 1.5 degrees. Um, and all of that led to a strategy called the Green Deal, which is not just a strategy to reduce emissions, it's also a strategy to reinvent our society and our economy. It's, it's much broader than ju just uh, uh, emissions. Now, strictly speaking, what we're doing is setting uh, Europe on a course to be climate neutral by 2050, uh, which is actually in, um, in historic terms tomorrow. Um, to do that, we need to charter the course very precisely. How do we decarbonize our economy? How do we change our energy mix? How do we change the way we eat? How do we change the way we produce? How do we turn our economy into a circular economy? How do we uh, uh, electrify? How do we bring in hydrogen? Uh, in other words, how do we decarbonize our energy uh, um, supplies? All of this comes into play. Now, before the COVID crisis, this was all a matter of when. We can do it now, we can wait a bit, some will do it earlier, others will do it later. Now, with the COVID crisis, I think one thing's clear, we only get one shot at doing it. Uh, because um, already before the COVID crisis, we had analysed that Europe would need between 260 and 300 billion euros of annual investment to make this transition uh, work. So after the COVID crisis, uh, we will have to mobilise as much money as we can to recover, but then recover in the right way. So instead of saying, which some said at the beginning, but fortunately you hardly ever hear anybody saying, it, instead of saying, let's first recover and then come back to the Green Deal, we're saying, no, the Green Deal is the way we need to recover. Why? Because already, as I said, in this industrial revolution, the economy was changing very quickly. If we now are going to pour the limited resources we will have into restoring the old economy instead of building the new economy, we will create very quickly stranded assets so that money will be lost. And then we will not have the financial means to invest in renovating, in, in creating the sustainable uh, uh, economy. And I say this with such force because what we are going to be doing now is we're going to borrow a lot of money. And to borrow that money, you actually say to your children, we're borrowing money and that's going to be on your shoulders, in addition to all the other things we're putting on your shoulders. So I can only do this. I can only justify doing that. We as a generation can only justify doing that if by doing that we create a better world. If by doing that we, we do comply with uh, our uh, commitments under the, under the uh, Paris Agreement, we do uh, stop uh, the loss of biodiversity. We do create the circular economy and all of that. So that's why we at the Commission believe that the Green Deal, combined with digitization and increasing Europe's resilience, should be the three pillars upon which we build the recovery after the COVID uh, uh, crisis. Now, one one final word because before we uh, go over to 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 the questions. In doing so, we need to be quick. If there's anything we've learned from previous crises is um, never fight this crisis as though it were the previous one, because then you lose a lot of money. And uh, we, we, we made a lot of mistakes last time around. We shouldn't be repeating those mistakes. Secondly, be quick. We need to be quick, uh, very quick. Thirdly, the response to the reaction should be commensurate to the depth of the crisis. So you have to put on the table a package which is, which is commensurate to the challenge you have, which means uh, the uh, in total, um, that's why we believe that it's good to have the in total 1.85 trillion, uh, because anything substantially less than that will not be uh, relative to the challenge we face. And third, 
you need to create a level playing field in Europe because that's the only way the internal market will survive this. And if survival of the internal market is not just a matter of uh, getting the economy going again, and you know, uh, like, like some say to the Dutch, the internal market, who are you going to sell your flowers to, if not to the Italians and others? So you better make sure uh, that you create a level playing field in the internal market. It's not just that. That's an important element for our economy, very important. But it's more than that. The European Union's internal market is what creates the power we have in the world. Uh, the attractiveness of Europe is in our rules, our regulations, the values Europe stands for, and the way we have organized our economy so to create enough mass, enough strength to uh, be able to make sure that those who want to be on our market comply with the rules of our market. So the rule setting of the EU is, a, is, is, a, is an extremely powerful tool for the EU to defend its interests and also to defend our values. This is all intimately linked with each other. If we don't do that, you see those who see international relations as a zero-sum game or as purely transactional, they try and split us. It is not by chance that some outside of Europe, whether it's the Chinese or the Amer some Americans, believe that it's in their interest to have a weak European Union. Why? Because then their counterparts are individual member states, and by definition, they are weaker than the EU as a whole. So also for this geopolitical reason, we need a strong and united Europe. And that's why I really hope we will get a decision on uh, Next Generation EU and, the, uh, and a serious MFF on the basis of the Commission proposal uh, uh, very soon, um, uh, hopefully later this week, so that Europe can move ahead and retain the leadership, which I think is seen globally, especially on um, reaching climate neutrality by 2050. Everybody's following this in the rest of the world, and we will set the, the pace, we will set the example, and hopefully others will follow. Thank you. Thank you so much for this overview. And uh, in many ways, one could say that we're extremely lucky to have the Green Deal and the fact that you worked on this already at the end of the year, end of last year, because now we have the strategy ready to guide us out of the crisis, to create the basis for the future economy. So it's really, obviously for Europe, um, it's really an opportunity not to be missed to utilize the Green Deal as the basis for green growth. We have some questions already um, written. Um, so one question comes from um, Erika Metzger, who's asking, how is the old economy defined? Which sectors and occupations does this mean and uh, cover concretely? Another question that we have is from uh, Jan von Herth, who's asking that how, to, how can we ensure general public support to avoid a populist backlash as we determine the actions that we take. And I would add in here another question, is that we're seeing a number of member states taking measures at the moment to rescue businesses. How do we really can ensure that these, will, these measures will not undermine EU's long-term goals for sustainable competitiveness. There are a lot of worries around how, for example, state AC is currently being used with no conditions attached. And just to link to this, while you said that uh, on one hand we should not treat this crisis as the last crisis, at the same time we have lessons from the last crisis. Um, it has been evaluated that green stimulus projects, for example, after the 2008 global financial crisis, created more jobs, delivered higher short-term returns and led to increased long-term cost savings than what was the case with traditional stimulus, for example, in fossil fuel projects. If this is the case, why is it so difficult to get member states to build on this potential and how good we get member states to take the right measures. Thank you. Quite a number of questions. Let me let me start with the what do I see as the old economy? Well, you know, um, it's also you can follow the markets. You look at look at what the big investors are doing. Look at what the insurance sector is doing. Look at what the banking sector is doing. They're quickly identifying what they see as future stranded assets. And where do they see them? Especially in the energy sector, anything linked to especially coal, but fossil fuel in general. If you look at the investments, uh, hugely down in those sectors, and they're still up in the renewable energy. Uh, you also see the 
um, development, price development in the renewable energy, it, it makes perfect sense to invest in wind and solar and in hydrogen. It doesn't make, and in, in, in other forms of, of, of sustainable energy, it doesn't make so much sense uh, to invest in fossil fuels anymore. I mean, that that is, I think, a clear development. And I also believe that um, uh, uh, sectors of the economy that are not heading towards circularity, uh, so that continue on the basis of you dig something up, you make something out of it, and then you throw it away, you use it, and then you throw it away, that has very little future unless you introduce elements of reuse, of recycling, uh, and of a different uh, basis on uh, primary uh, products, uh, uh, primary materials. Uh, so I think that's also uh, very clear. I also believe that um, our uh, transportation needs uh, and our mobility needs will quickly uh, evolve. Um, I think you will see in the automotive industry a very swift development towards EVs, electric vehicles, uh, and a, a relatively uh, quick phase out of especially the most polluting uh, combustion engines. Um, uh, you will see in um, a, a revival of uh, 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 more less polluting transport forms also for the mid and longer distances, especially rail. You will see that happening. You also will see a, a change in which the airline industry is organized and, and uh, in, in the fuel mix they will be using shipping is the same, uh, I think. Um, and you will see, I believe, I hope, um, a rethink of how we um, uh, produce uh, uh, food and how we consume food. I think this is also uh, one area where you will see uh, developments. There are many, many other areas, but I wanted to mention some of these priority areas uh, that we see uh, happening. We want to uh, also stimulate some of these developments. Um, and this brings me to the uh, second question, how do you prevent a populist backlash? Well, first of all, I believe we underestimate, if we are afraid of a public backlash, we underestimate the growing consensus among our population that the climate crisis is real and that we need to do something about it. The, the, the biggest fear I have is that people become uh, desperate. People think, well, it's lost anyway, uh, so why bother? Uh, because we can't save uh, our climate anyway. And we need to demonstrate very concrete, or I can't afford it. Uh, we need to demonstrate very quickly that this is feasible. Uh, it's a huge effort. It's complicated, but it's feasible. It's not a technological challenge. It's not a financial challenge, it's a political challenge. It's an organizational challenge more than anything else. So we need to show with the first things we do that th this actually works. That's why we so strongly believe in the renovation way, um, where we help housing become uh, uh, much more fuel, uh, fuel efficient to switch to uh, sustainable uh, heating uh, 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 modes, um, to insulate housing, to create better grids, um, uh, to green cities, um, uh, to uh, create climate neutral office buildings. All these things can be done immediately leads to uh, uh, jobs, jobs across the spectrum uh, of uh, qualifications. It leads to, uh, to jobs that are profitable to both small and medium sized enterprises and big corporations. It leads to jobs that you cannot delocalize. They happen locally everywhere. And it leads to an improvement of livability, which will get more enthusiasm of the population. And their energy bills will go down. The air quality will go up. I only see pluses here, but you need to invest in that. And you need to get it organized at a scale that makes sense. So I think this is the best answer uh, to a potential populist uh, backlash. Um, uh, but uh, again, I, I stress uh, my fear is not so much those who deny uh, climate change. I fear more those who are become des uh, are becoming desperate about climate change uh, because they don't see that we can tackle it. We can tackle it, but we have to act uh, very, very uh, quickly. Now, in terms of the and, and this is this is I think a crucial question for now and the months to come. We will see, especially after the summer some very, very serious economic downturn and some very, very serious economic effects on employment, uh, uh, etc. Uh, so we have to brace ourselves for that. And I'm a politician. I know what the risk then is in panic or in desperation or because you simply want to help people. Politicians, if we don't organize it according to good plans, 
will start throwing money at anything just to keep it upright. And if we don't work according to plans, if we don't work according to national plans and European plans, then money will be lost and we'll end up in stranded assets very soon. And then jobs will disappear, but they only will disappear a year later. And you help no one with that. You only, you only wrongly spend money that then will no longer be there to do the right thing. So the, the, the most important thing now is that both at the EU level, we've done our homework, but also at national levels, the needs for recovery and transformation are put down clearly in plans. And that we at the European level assert these plans and then support the plans that take us into a sustainable future and discourage the plans that will slow down the change to a sustainable future. Uh, but at the end of the day, you have to get the population along. We're democracies. If people don't want it or don't believe in it or uh, run away from it, it's not going to happen. So you have to get people to tag along, but not in the sense that you throw money at anything just to keep people short term happy. That will make them long term even more unhappier uh, if you're not very careful. So I hope we can convince all member states and ourselves together to work on comprehensive plans that are coordinated, that all go into the same direction of creating a future-proof, sustainable economy with new jobs, sustainable jobs, so that we have something to show for ourselves and for our children. Excellent. Thank you so much. Well, oh, um, we have Joe Leinen who would like to ask a question. Um, my colleagues will unmute you so that you can speak. Hello, good afternoon, uh, Annika and uh, Franz. Um, indeed, uh, this is an extraordinary situation, and I think we have an extraordinary chance for innovation. And um, Franz mentioned already the uh, broad direction uh, where we want to go. Now, among the many questions, maybe only one. Uh, how can we achieve uh, to green the high energy intensive industries? Um, um, for railways, for windmills, we will need steel, we will need uh, aluminum, copper. And I know that this transformation needs a lot of money. And I would like to see an innovation fund much bigger than the one we have uh, to help these industries to stay in Europe and to give us green steel, green copper, green aluminum, green cement and green chemistry. Let's mention only those ones. Maybe Franz could... Uh, answer this question. Thank you. Should I Thank answer straight much. away? Sure, let's do that. Yo um, um, has, a, has a, um, a crucial question. This is, this is going to be almost um, the proof of whether we are capable to do what we need to do. I cannot imagine a Europe that doesn't have its own steel industry. Uh, that if you, if you talk about Europe's resilience, if you talk about geopolitical questions, um, I believe we need to make sure that in some areas uh, we are able to provide things that need to be provided to keep our industry strong and future proof. But I don't believe in, in the old steel industry uh, that is dependent on coal or other very, very polluting uh, um, carbon based uh, non renewable uh, fuel uh, sources. So, what if we accept the challenge to create green steel within within the decade, within five, six years. The technology is there. It is not ready for the market yet, but it can be if we invest enough in it. And I mean making steel with hydrogen, green hydrogen, clean hydrogen. Uh, and of course, we will need transitional phases where we use decarbonated hydrogen uh, made on the basis of decarbonated, uh, decarbonated uh, 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 natural gas. but Given the capacity we're now quickly building of uh, offshore wind and solar, it's becoming increasingly profitable to make hydrogen with that. And hydrogen can use, be used in these uh, difficult to abate industrial sectors. Um, we will also need to further develop other technologies. In the cement industry, for instance, we will need to use, because you cannot fully decarbonate that industry, but we need cement, so we need to use ways to uh, uh, capture and store carbon uh, and, and the technology is there. It was not very successful when we tried to use it on coal, but coal is going away anyway. But uh, cap uh, carbon capture and storage 
in the cement industry and some other industries, like I, I mentioned natural gas uh, early, earlier, can be a very, very successful contribution to um, uh, create a future for difficult to abate uh, heavy industri industrial uh, sectors. So I think these are measures we need to do because it's not just about decarbonizing our economy. It's also about increasing Europe's resilience. We're not alone in the world. We cannot afford to, abend to depend entirely on uh, production uh, elsewhere in the world. And if we don't sort of make a breakthrough and create green steel, it will also take the other parts of the world much, much longer to decarbonize their steel production and other uh, heavy industrial production. But if Europe leads the way and sets the norms, I think we have a winner. We have also a winner in terms of economic growth. And I believe we need to heavily invest in that. In, in now, in the years to come, uh, to make that happen. I think that's where the future for Europe's industry lies. Thank you very much. And that also raises obviously the question, how do we create that demand on the European market for these solutions? Because our home market really is the place where to start from. We have a number of written questions and um, I'll try to group them together to some extent. Um, as a follow-up um, to already what has been discussed, Neme Abisad is asking, what do you think fossil fuel like natural gas companies should do in order to be part of this new direction? Also, Dimitri Korpakis is asking, and um, noting that the Green Deal, as the Green Deal was adopted in the pre-COVID era, we cannot possibly go on with the same priorities, as now really the priority is the survival of European industry as well as small businesses. And then the question is, do we need to have an adopted policy roadmap for the Green Deal while COVID is still around? And another question he put forward is that in terms of implementation, do you believe that the sub-national um, regional players have a particular role to play in the implementation of the Green Deal? So if we start with these, thank you. Yes, well, um, I think um, already if you look across the world, many uh, of those involved, uh, heavily involved in the fossil fuel uh, industry, uh, whether it's the big oil companies or whether it's regions where that's important, are starting to look beyond uh, the fossil fuel era. Uh, that's because that's in the nature of this industry. They all always have to do very long-term projections. That's what they that's what they always do, uh, and they see that the time that we are post uh, uh, post fossil fuel is coming. Uh, so what are they doing? I, I see them looking for intermediary solutions, and I think hydrogen is part of that. But also long-term hydrogen solutions will be there. So hydrogen produced with uh, uh, wind and solar is something they see a role in, uh, because if if for those companies the added value in the future is no longer what they is extract from the ground or out of the sea, but the added value is what they have in terms of assets in in logistics and infrastructure. They can retain that added value because also in a in a a post fossil fuel world we will need to transport energy carriers over longer distances and share that because they will not be able to be produced in the same place where they are consumed only. Um, and then they see for themselves added value. That's why also countries in the Gulf are now massively investing in, for instance, electrolyzers to create uh, 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 hydrogen. Um, and the, as, as you perhaps know, uh, the physical infrastructure we have, especially for natural gas, is adaptable. Uh, to also be used for other uh, energy carrying gases such as hydrogen and perhaps others that can be made on the basis of hydrogen. And refurbishing that infrastructure for hydrogen and other uh, decarbonated or, or, or uh, sustainable energy carriers uh, costs about one quarter of the price uh, uh, of building completely new uh, infrastructure. So there's a business model there, I think, in, in the core that could be that could be developed. But I'm not naive. There will also be uh, fossil fuel companies who will do everything they can to delay the transition or to increase uh, the production or the use of fossil fuels. And I think uh, policymakers will have to make very smart choices not to be lured into that uh, and to make sure the investments we make all take us into 
a fossil free uh, uh, future, at least a climate neutral uh, uh, future, uh, which is the most important uh, thing. Um, now, on the issue of, uh, I, I really, really would like you to not see a contradiction between the Green Deal and responding to the COVID crisis. Uh, of course, in the minds of people, where the climate crisis might have been the num their number one concern, that's no longer the number one concern today. The number one concern is their health, rightly so. I mean, so many people have died. So many people are suffering the long-term long consequences of, of this horrible, horrible uh, uh, virus. Um, so that's the first concern. Second concern will be uh, uh, the jobs. And, and you rightly mentioned small and medium-sized enterprises because they don't have the luxury very often to do long-term projections like the big companies do over 20, 30, 40, 50 years. They're thinking about tomorrow, about next month. How do I keep my employees in their jobs? How do I keep my business alive? So I, um, I fully understand that sense of urgency. But if we were to say, let's forget about the Green Deal now, first recover, we could say that if we were not in the middle of an industrial revolution, but we're also in the middle of an industrial revolution. The economy needs to be restructured anyway. And let's then do it on the basis of the Green Deal as our growth strategy. The Green Deal is the best way to get Europe to grow quickly again. Um, and this will need, I mean, in any time of fundamental restructuring, it creates a lot of anxiety. But if we don't organize this politically, I mean, every history book on previous industrial revolutions will tell you if you don't organize this if you don't organize essentially redistribution because it's always about redistribution you will create a number of huge winners small number of huge winners and a huge number a huge number of big losers and that's what we need to prevent we need to make sure that we leave no one behind and the market is not going to take care of this it is not we need public authorities to galvanize society because this is going to be a joint effort. And here the private sector is not your enemy because the private sector very often already understands this needs to happen. They see it coming. We need to create alliances across the board to take our society into a sustainable society on the basis of a fair redistribution and a new redistribution because we have new production factors data was never a production factor in the previous industrial revolutions now it's one of the most important production factors and also the natural limits of mother earth is a production factor and this has to be discounted in how we redistribute uh, values across the, the uh, production factors across the world and oh yeah subnational i forgot that point you know one of the and recent elections seem to underscore that point. One of the big risks we run in our society is a deep, deep divide uh, between urban and rural areas. And this, this is really, really concerning, really worrying. Um, and you will have seen that the sense of urgency to adapt uh, so that we avoid a climate disaster is stronger in urban areas than in rural areas. Um, but also because of this new economy, this, econo this, this industrial revolution, urban areas have a huge advantage vis-a-vis -vis -vis rural areas in terms of where the talent goes, in terms of where the economic growth is. And also here we need urgently redistribution. We need to make sure that urban areas understand they cannot survive if rural areas aren't doing well. And we also need rural areas to understand that the bristling, the brightening, the, the, the bubbling of uh, urban areas is also in their advantage if you organize it well. So also here, subnational authorities are extremely important to also create links, to create cross alliances, to make sure that also here we leave no one behind. It's also about this form of res uh, redistribution is going to be increasingly important.
Thank you very much. We have a number of additional written questions coming in. I'll start with uh, some of the follow-up questions. We have Tilman Kuffer who's asking, how can we handle the carbon leakage? That's, um, that is the outsourcing, the uh, dirty production of goods we then import in a WTO compatible way. Constance Khan is asking or noting that the latest MFF and next generation EU suggest increasing climate target from 25 to 30 percent, while again the MEPs are asking for 50 percent. What is feasible? And then I'll take a question also on the trust transition as that has also been mentioned. How can we make sure that, um, this is a question from Michael Kuhn, how can we make sure that the necessary transition to a green Europe is a just, that does not leave people behind? And I would add there the elements that obviously we are seeing this opposition from those that are against the change or that may be losing their jobs. So how can we use this just transition to overcome this opposition? Thank you very much. Well, on the issue of carbon carbon leakage, uh, look, um, I think you know large parts of the world, uh, large parts of the world, committed uh, to uh, the Paris Agreement. And if you commit to the Paris Agreement, you have to show what measures you're going to take to get to carbon neutrality, in our case, climate neutrality, by the mid by the middle of of this this century. So we have a plan, and we want to put it into execution. We, do, we ask of others to do the same and show it to us. If they don't do that, then we would put our industry at a terrible disadvantage if we were to impose all these measures, put a price on carbon, etc., and not and not protect them against uh, competition based on non-carbon uh, price production. Um, so then we will have to correct that at the border. That's why we uh, think. We have to be surgical about it, precise per sector and etc. We think we might need a carbon border adjustment mechanism to make sure that there's no carbon leakage and to make sure that we create a level playing field for our industry on the basis of what I think is a global goal, which is uh, a carbon neutrality by the middle of the century. And that's how we are going to go about it. I strongly believe this is completely in line with the WTO uh, requirements. And I'm, I'm more than happy to defend it in WTO if there are questions. Um, I think others will start moving in the same direction, perhaps not at our pace, but if we lead the way, then others will follow. Uh, and well, we also have to wait for what's going to happen in November in the US and we'll see what's going to happen there. We have an opening, an opening with China around this. There are also other parts of the world who've understood this is moving faster uh, than we thought. So I am on balance optimistic but i'm not naive so i know we might have to protect europe and its industry and for that we might need a carbon border uh, adjustment mechanism um now uh about the percentages uh, you know we are we are in a situation where we have to have everyone on board the european parliament but also the member states and i believe the proposal we've made and uh, also you see it in the negotiation box of the president of the european council it looks as though uh, the percentages of um, uh, spending on climate measures is, is going up, which is good. But there's one more important thing uh, that I want to point uh, to. We also agreed to insert a do no harm principle in all EU spending, which would mean that we would have to, to uh, check against delivery of measures, whether this measure does harm to our intention to be climate neutral by 2050. If it does harm, it should not get any European funds. If it does no harm, even if perhaps uh, some of it does not immediately relate to climate policy, but if it does no harm, then it would be eligible for European support. And then step by step, we can increase the percentage uh, that is actually uh, climate, uh, directly climate policy uh, related. Now, on the issue of leaving, I feel passionate about the issue of leaving no one behind. Um, for many, many reasons. Uh, first, for a pragmatic reason also. Um, leaving people behind means that you will mobilize your own resistance and then you will be bogged down in endless discussions and you cannot, you know, uh, make the transformation uh, happen the way uh, you want it. But that's only a pragmatic reason. The fundamental reason is based on our values. Our society is, I would say, based on the principle that we leave no one behind. 
Of course, there are differences in society and there will uh, remain differences in society. But we've seen that those societies that are able to keep the gaps between people in different levels um, uh, uh, small, so in societies where the distribution of what we have is more equal, there is less crime, there is better health, there's better education, there's better well-being, there are better jobs. So we have a huge incentive to make sure that we don't leave groups behind. And it is always difficult in a transformational time, as I said before. You know, our society, the, the industrial revolution we're going through is the most profound humanity has ever been in. Why? Because it's happening at lightning speed and it's happening all over the world at the same time. That's never happened before in human history. And we have to adapt to that. And, you know, the, 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 the new thing in, in our society is, and, and I, I don't want to become too philosophical, but I think it's an important point. The new thing in our society is this. Before, in changes, uh, especially in the previous century, very often, more often than not, the expectation was of improvement. Yes, this is a difficult change. It's going to be painful. But at the end of the tunnel, there's light and I will be better off. Now we're in a situation, especially in Western Europe and in other, some other developed parts of the world, where we perceive any change as a potential loss and that gains are not seen, only losses. And if that is the psyche in which a society is, that any form of change will be resisted, pushed away. And I think this is one of the biggest challenges in our society is to convince people, to show people that change can ben is beneficial in the long run for them as well. People are willing to take a step back, to take a deep breath, to accept temporary setbacks if they know that for them, but especially for their children, the future will be better. I think at this stage, it is not convincing me enough demonstrated that we can create a better future. If we do that, then I believe people will, will join the movement, as young, many, many, most young people now do, and that we can overcome this anxiety of loss, which is now stronger than the hope of improvement. We need to make the hope of improvement stronger than the anxiety of loss. Then our society will move into the direction we need. That's my deepest conviction. Excellent. Thank you so much. Another set of written questions. We have a very quiet audience today. Uh, they prefer written questions today. We have Pernat Vespo, who is following up on the question uh, of carbon border adjustment, adjustment mechanism and is asking that as it looks very complex and will take time to be implemented, how can we reconcile this? Um, another follow-up question comes from Marijn uh, van der Velde. Which elements do you see essential for the future common agriculture policy if we are to ensure that CAP will really contribute to achieving the goals of the farm to fork strategy with benefits for climate, environment and biodiversity? And this obviously links also with the question of do no harm. And then Olav Ovrevo is asking that how can we ensure that member states really prioritize green transition projects when they are planning their um, when they're doing their plans under the recovery and resilience facility? Thank you. On the calm border adjustment, yeah, it's complicated. Uh, I mean, it would be simple if we could just uh, slap a tariff on everything that comes from the outside uh, that is uh, um, not. Uh, carbon neutral, uh, but it's too complicated because we have to look at different sectors. Not all sectors are affected in the same way. Um, uh, so we have to look at the different sectors and then determine per sector how we, whether we need to protect the sector and how we best uh, protect uh, the sector. Take steel, for instance. There it is relatively simple to calculate the price of a ton of steel whether, uh, on the basis also of its carbon footprint. Uh, and then if you see the difference in carbon footprint, you can also uh, determine how you accommodate that difference with a carbon border adjustment to create a level playing field. Uh, but in other industries, it's more complicated. But I, I do not want to, to be one of those politicians that tell you something is actually quite simple when it's not. It is complicated. 
it is complicated and it will be technically complicated to do this but i think we need to do it also the nitty-gritty also the complicated things because we have to be able to defend it in wto and in other forms or vis-a-vis uh, -vis parts of the european industry that would absolutely not like any form of carbon border adjustment because it doesn't help their business model so we have to be uh, a rational precise thorough and yes, it's going to be complicated, but I think we can do it. We have the means, we have the people who can ascertain this. And in some sectors, as I said, with steel, it's going to be easier than in others. But uh, I, cannot, I cannot deny that this is going to be complicated, but we need to do it. But also we have uh, the advantage of having a well-functioning uh, emissions trading system, which is actually, which has weathered the crisis better than I had uh, thought. Uh, and some of its critics uh, had already predicted it would collapse. It didn't. Uh, the price is even up in terms of the price per ton of carbon and i think this is a good basis for a, a global system of putting a price on carbon and incentivizing incentivizing industries to reduce the price of carbon but if we get carbon border adjustment then we also have to quickly reduce the free allowances we have given to industries and make sure that all industries that are in the uh, emissions trading system uh, pay a fair price for the uh, carbon they emit. So it is all linked. I know it is a complex thing, but we can handle this and we need to do this in a way that we can also explain to all stakeholders, those who are in favor and those who are not in favor of this uh, system. On the future of the common agricultural policy, I think uh, we try to outline this both in the uh, farm to fork strategy as in the biodiversity uh, strategy. Look, it's going to be a, an incredible challenge uh, to feed 10 billion people and to do this in a way that creates a balance with our natural environment. Uh, we will then have to look uh, at seriously reducing uh, the uh, fertilizers uh, we use, seriously reducing the pesticides uh, we, we uh, use, seriously uh, uh, improving the way we use water, uh, seriously investing in latest technology uh, to do precision agriculture. So we need broadband everywhere in our rural areas so that farmers can be helped to precisely do their production. We need to give, we need to give more priority to the income of farming families rather than to uh, subsidizing huge scale uh, ownership uh, of farms. We need to make sure uh, we um, uh, inform people that um their um uh, consumption patterns have an influence on emissions you know the agriculture is only responsible for about 10 percent of of uh, uh carbon emissions um uh, in 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 europe uh but of that 10 percent 70 percent is linked to animal husbandry is linked to 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 uh, livestock um so if our consumption patterns if informed uh, consumers would change the patterns uh, of consumption away a bit from meat to other uh, um, uh, products that would already have a, a, a hugely beneficial impact on our emissions and it would relieve some of the pressure on agriculture because also you need much more water you need much more land you need much more grain you need much more imports um, uh, for uh, livestock than you do for uh, vegetation uh, so all these elements will come uh, into play but the one thing i want to to make very clear is we need a vibrant and strong farming community to do all of this and to also be the custodians of a stronger natural environment uh, without farm farming as it is today is in part a threat to our biodiversity farming as we it could be tomorrow is in fact is 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 good for biodiversity is good for creating more carbon sink we want to, in the next 10 years, we want to plant 3 billion trees in Europe, addition. Uh, we need to um, re-sanitize our forests. Many of our forests are in a very, very bad shape already because of uh, uh, um, a climate change. And we need to make sure that people who live there and work there are custodians of these natural treasures. And we need to put the farming community in that position. So there's so many things we need to do. Um, but I also know that, that, that many in the farming community as I was saying earlier, many in the farming community are really, really very worried about the future. And, and, and in, in some countries, you also see in my country, for instance, but also in Germany and some other countries, you also see that the next generation is rather reluctant uh, to take over farming from their parents, also because they, 
they they see too little future in it. And we need to make sure that there is a future in farming. They will need to feed us. They fed us extremely well during the pandemic. They did an incredible job. And they will have to continue to do that job. And we will need to support them. But it cannot continue on the basis of how it's going uh, uh, today. Um, now, how do we assure that countries stick to uh, the priorities in the, in the transition? I think we need to um, make sure that everybody presents their national plans for recovery, that we align them with our European plans for recovery and that we make sure that we only support national plans for recovery when they lead us in, into that direction. And that member states who decide to do different things will be on their own. I think this is extremely important. And I'm very grateful that um, uh, uh, President Michel also made that clear in his negotiating box and his comments that support will go to countries that do the right thing, le leading into the right direction. If you don't do that, you will not get any support. Excellent. Thank you very much. I see that we are shortly running out of time and I would just like to use this last round of questions to pick on something um, that has come in, but then also I put in a question of my own. So just to say, obviously, there will be transitional costs, not only in the energy sector, but also in making agriculture, as has been discussed, mobility more sustainable in achieving circular economy. Money is limited. How and where should that be spent now? And how can we address the vested interests? And uh, this also links to the question that what would, as we have the EU heads of state and government convening this week, what would be your key message to them, your expectations and hopes for, for this week? Um, and then we have a question from Judith Schilling, what are your personal key milestones for the launch and implementation of the EU Green Deal? And I would like to finish up with the question on global context. Context: What's the state with the global cooperation on climate action and how global recovery measures can be aligned with the Paris Agreement? Thank you very much. Um, well, very interesting questions, and let me try and answer them as uh, to the best of my my ability. Uh, my appeal to the leaders would be: be quick, uh, don't hesitate. Uh, be sure you do enough for us to actually have a chance at recovery. So don't be stingy, uh, because it will not help us. Uh, we only get one chance, uh, and that chance is now. Uh, and then I would say, make sure you create a level playing field. You can use other words. You can see. You can say, make sure you so, show solidarity. But in this case, solidarity is just enlightened self-interest uh, because the solidarity you show to others leads to uh, the uh, internal market, uh, uh, the common market surviving, and that is <laughs> in the interest of everyone. And it gives Europe a stronger position uh, globally. Now, what would be uh, uh, goals? I would say that that's why we have rescheduled, redrafted the, the Green Deal to, to also uh, be an answer to, to uh, the crisis as a result of the pandemic. Let's start with the renovation wave. I think that is a winner for everyone. Uh, let's start with the renovation wave um, uh, so that we can show quick results, uh, in, both in terms of economic growth, jobs, emission reductions, uh, avoiding uh, energy poverty, which is a risk for many people, and showing that you know uh, climate policy can also be good and and effective and and lead to quick results. So the renovation wave would be my personal goal, but also one of the things I would recommend uh, we do quickly. Secondly, let's make sure we make this uh, we huge we use the huge opportunity of what is happening in the energy sector and push it even faster towards the energy transition. It is happening as we speak. The price of renewable energy is, is plummeting, which is a huge investment opportunity. The demand of electricity might even triple in Europe. So more uh, electricity production is absolutely essential. Let's make it uh, renewable um, uh, electricity. Let's make sure we have the right infrastructure to share that huge potential where it is needed and when it is needed. Let's make sure we have, you know, we had negative energy prices last week. Why? Because there was a lot of wind, a lot of solar and nowhere to go with that energy. So let's make sure we have ways of transporting it, but also ways of storing it. And in that, I strongly believe in the hydrogen strategy. 
Europe still leads on hydrogen. Let's keep that lead. Let's invest in that because it's good for our heavy industry, the so-called difficult to abate areas. It's good for heavy transport, for our airlines in the future, for our shipping in the future. And it's a wonderful way of storing renewable energy and transporting it everywhere in Europe and beyond Europe, which takes me into the third point. What is our global role? I honestly believe that Europe is never going to be the one that says we have so much military might, uh, we can uh, dominate through that. And I would, I would not even advocate that. I don't think that's where our strength is. Our strength is in the resilience of our society, the values we share, the beauty of our social systems. And I think that with all the differences we have, if you look at other parts of the world in this pandemic, our social systems, our educational systems, our healthcare systems prove that these have incredible value and are highly valued by the European population. We need to keep investing in them, fostering them, protecting them. That's where our strength lies. And we do that by creating a strong economy. We create a strong economy because of the scale of Europe, because of the uh, uh, power of our population, because of their intelligence, because of their inventiveness. But we need the European scale. Reverting back to nationalism, to everyone on his own, would be the biggest, biggest mistake Europeans could make in these days. And by doing this together as Europeans, we will have an influence on our international environment. This will have a huge geopolitical influence. Let's start by understanding that our destiny is intimately linked with our sister continent, which is Africa. Let Europe concentrate on Africa more than anything else in uh, the coming uh, uh, decades. I think there's a huge look at the demographics, look at the potential, look at the potential for economic growth. There is so much we could achieve, these two sister continents uh, uh, together. And then, of course, in the next couple of months, we'll see some choppy seas in international politics leading up to November. We will see some uh, difficult conflicts uh, that we will need uh, to face. But I'm confident that as Europeans, if we show unity now in the next couple of weeks, we will benefit from that uh, in the future. Uh, and I want to end on this positive note because I know it's very challenging, but it's within our grasp uh, to do this. And I would encourage everyone listening in today and, and, and joining the conversation to keep this in mind and to also you know, spread the word. Thank you. Thank you so much. We've covered so much ground and I'm sure there would have been so many more questions to be answered. I'm very sorry for our audience if we were not able to answer all of your questions. Something I would like to finish off and pick up on what you mentioned as well, for example, in relation to um, food systems and agriculture is that there's a lot that we can do by combining the digital transformation with the green transition. And I would like to highlight that at EPC, we've actually published yesterday a paper that looks at aligning the green transition with the digital transformation. So do have a look. We believe that it's the potential is enormous, but it does need to be guided. Thank you so much for the discussion we've had today. Um, it's been wonderful to have you, Mr. Timmermans, join us. This surely is the time when we need leadership and let's hope that our leaders have what it takes to use the Green Deal as the compass for action and deliver on the green and digital transitions. We will continue following and participating in these debates and very much look forward to having you, Mr. Timmermans, join us in the future as well. And also, of course, all our participants to come and participate in the future discussions. Wishing you all a very good afternoon and thank you very much for joining. Bye.